Okay, so um, injury prevention. Um, this is kind of a newer thing that we have here. So um, I personally, we kind of had mentioned I had worked at the university for a little bit. So I worked at Missouri State for eight years, the first eight years of my career actually. I did undergrad there and grad school and they gave me my first big girl job. So I owe a lot to them for all of that, obviously. I worked women's basketball primarily, supervised soccer. Um, I kind of throw this up there because that was my front page of the sports section picture. So um, it's more Casey than me, so that's always good, the athlete. But um, I, after being at the university, came to Cox South and they initially put me up at Fairgrove High School, which is a small school in the north side of town. Um, we actually got the contract for Ozark High School right at that two year mark. and they were the first high school in this area that wanted two athletic trainers. And given my experience with D1, they asked me to kind of move into that role and I got to be the first head athletic trainer of a school with two athletic trainers. So really cool experience being at a larger school. To be honest, there's about 520 athletes in that school and that was more athletes than I'd ever dealt with in my entire career, but it, it was still a really awesome experience. It's very much those big schools that we have in Sarah, very much like small colleges when you look at how they're ran sports wise. Um, and while I was there, we work a lot as athletic trainers at the high school with our local EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters, just in some basic education and training. Um, we go out because um, think about like a football related injury. If there's a C-spine injury, they have a lot of equipment on. Um, and if it's a heat stroke related injury, there's things that we're doing in the sports medicine world that we know, first of all, those two injuries we have to call 911. And we want those EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters that are responding to be familiar with us and us familiar with them and all of us to be on the same page of what our policies and procedures are. Um, so we have that training. And I was out at Ozark Fire and kind of talking about these things. And really the conversation was just like this before we got started today. Just we're all getting to know each other, talking about various things. And it became one of those conversations of, oh, you don't have access to these things that I am able to provide for seventh graders and ninth graders and 12th graders. And so for me, it just kind of opened up that thought and that, that realm of, these people are dedicating their lives to serving their communities and they don't have basic access to injury prevention or, or some really good just, um, you know, initial care because of certain reasons. Um, and so that got me thinking about being more of that tactical outreach athletic trainer. So my bosses um, allowed me to create this. Um, and so here we are, it's kind of grown. I'm contract with fire departments primarily. Um, I have a one law enforcement um, and then I get to come hang out with you guys every two weeks, do some education, grand rounds, stuff like that. And yeah, it's been fun. Um, how many times have you heard the mission and vision up to this point? Probably a ton, right? So to improve the health of the communities we serve through that quality health care, education and research. Um, no matter how you look at that, no matter what details you pull from that, really it's to be the best for those we serve, right? Um, we also have Wellness for Warriors. Wellness for Warriors is a program here at Cox Health that um, it really started out as kind of a place for, for um, vets that work at Cox Health to kind of come and get to know each other and, and, and network with each other. And then they really started looking at it going, wait a minute, when you look at public safety in general, that officer, that firefighter, that paramedic, that air care nurse, that um, ED doc, they're really minded the same way that military person is. And so Wellness for Warriors grew and expanded um, and then they um, put out their mission to be the best for the heroes that need us and just kind of all encompassing of those groups. And it meets um, weekly not live at this point, because obviously we're in a different time right now, but they meet, um, they have Facebook Live stuff that they do. Um, and they just talk about everything that could pertain to public safety and military. So they'll talk about um, retirement for firefighters. Um, they'll talk about 
um, you know, the, the normal things that you would think about, like a PTSD or a compassion fatigue type topic. Um, but sometimes they'll just come in and people will tell stories. So it's a really cool group to network. They connect with other groups in this area geared towards public safety and military. Um, so last weekend they had a, a event with Sheepdog which is um, a local group, a local chapter of a national group that they go out on adventures. So they went like skeet shooting, I think last weekend, um, but sometimes they go up to Colorado and do whitewater rafting. So there's a lot of really cool things going on. And on the mental wellness side, just know that there are a lot of things out there for you guys. So Wellness for Warriors can be found on the internet page for Cox Health and the intranet page for Cox Health. So no matter how you're accessing our website, you're gonna be able to find Wellness for Warriors in the search engine. When we talk about being the best for those we serve, one thing that we have to remember is not only our education, not only our training and our skills, but it's also taking care of ourselves. So if we're coming in and um, we are highly educated, highly skilled, highly trained, um, but we're having issues ourselves, we're not 100% that day. And all of that skills and training and education is only going to go so far if you yourself are struggling with something. So whether it be a mental wellness side or what we're talking about today on the injury prevention side, the physical wellness side, we need to be taking care of those things on a regular basis. So a couple nerdy slides on some facts. Um, 33 to 41%, so a little more than a third of public safety injuries are gonna be sprains and strains. That puts you guys three times higher of an injury rate than the average workforce. That's pretty significant, right? And that also identifies the fact that this job is a physical job. Um, so when we look at those injuries specifically, a third of those injuries are gonna be contributed generally to overexertion. So when anyone says overexertion to me, I have two things that pop into my head. One, is their training lacking somewhere? Are they not taking care of themselves in a way that is making them efficient in how they move so that they're least likely to get injured? Or are they just not doing it at all? So is the training insufficient or is there a complete lack of training. And you'll hear this a lot where people are like, oh yeah, I need to start doing that again. Or I need to start taking care of myself again. Or I'm going to start running again. Or I'm going to start doing this again. And that's totally fine, but that tells me that they're not, so they're not even getting a minimum um, um, version of some kind of base of strength and, and prevention. Um, and then another thing with this job, you have a lot of things that are job related that contribute to that potential injury. One of which, long periods of time sitting right? Um, so sitting for that long period of time, you feel tight. You probably don't feel like your body doesn't want to work when you go to stand up. Um, that can lead to those low back discomforts, maybe even that sciatica type thing. Um, some knee pain. Have you ever had that quote unquote theater knee where you go and you sit down for like two or three hours and you go to get up and your knee hurts? Um, so that long periods of time sitting is definitely something that contributes rotated to one side to access the patient while bracing. Um, so as you're kind of going through, obviously they talk about like um, getting those interventions done before you're in route, um, but you're also monitoring while you're in route. So you may have that chair completely rotated over, but then maybe something happens and you have to brace yourself while reaching to do something. So that laterally rotating while bracing um, to reach and do something is going to be something that could contribute to an injury. And then heavy lifting in tight, awkward spaces. Um, don't you wish the lift assist could happen in the middle of the floor? Like, can someone just fall in the middle of the floor? But they don't, do they? Um, that's why they called for that lift assist, because they need help and they a lot of times are in a tight, awkward space. So you yourself have to get into maybe an awkward position to help them out of that tight, awkward space. That heavy lifting potentially in those awkward positions um, can contribute to some um, acute pain. When we talk about injury prevention, I don't want it to seem overwhelming. I don't want it to seem like we're trying to say, okay, like 
here's this big list of things that you got to do. I expect you to do it every day, blah, blah, blah. Um, it really is a little bit goes a long way when we talk about injury prevention. So um, Benjamin Franklin's ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Just kind of remember that. I don't have to do a ton, but that little bit that I can do each day, or I know I can do it three times a week, it's really going to go a long way towards these things. One thing that we do here for injury prevention is we do our post-offer employment test. You guys remember this test where you go up and you have to do compressions and then we have you, it's basically simulating a scene because you arrive on scene, you do compressions, you load the patient, all those things. Everybody remember that? So that is actually a whole body mobility, stability, strength and endurance baseline of what you need to be able to do this, this job. And so by looking at those baseline measurements, we say, um, while this person may not be the strongest that we have, we know that they can do it in the minimum. Um, and so that kind of rules out people that maybe can't do that physically. It's post-offer. Um, and so legally, that you, we, we have to be able to hire you and then you have to be able to go through that test. So. It protects you as the employee and it protects them as the em employer as well. We do that annually as well. So you thought you probably got, did a great job on that first one, but it's coming around next year too. So um, I believe they do it regionally now. So everyone in the region um, will kind of test about the same month. So even if you started and you tested, um, don't be surprised if, if everyone in your regions, maybe six months later, you may have to retest again pretty soon. But then after that, it's only every year. Um, the other part of our injury prevention, besides the post-offer employment test, is if you are someone that's looking to, it's like, okay, I either need to improve how I'm training my body or I need to get started in how I'm training my body. One thing that has changed is our pyramid has changed in how we build strength and endurance and power. So does anybody remember the, this was probably more of like the 90s, like the pyramid used to be just a pyramid with three levels and it was strength, power, and then endurance at the top. So basically it assumed that strength was your base, power came after that, and endurance was at the top. Um, we've gotten quite a bit um, more technical in how we, we understand the body and how it actually builds these things. So first of all, one thing that's on here that I'll talk about, but um, or one thing that's not on there that I'll talk about is mobility. Um, mobility isn't on there because first of all, we're talking about strength, but mobility is all encompassing. In order to be stable, strong, and powerful, you have to be mobile. You are not as stable, as strong, or as powerful as you could be if you're not mobile. So just imagine mobility is all encompassing of this um, tiered pyramid. Stabilization is at the bottom. So once we work on mobility, we have to also work on not only um, being able to move, but be able to move in a controlled way. But we have to also add endurance into there too. So endurance, if you'll notice, is with stability, with that strength, and it's actually with power as well. So we build our mobility and stability, and then we do it for long periods of time. We build our strength, and then we do it for long periods of time, and then that puts us into power and be able to be powerful for long periods of time. So it's kind of one of those, um, you know, the Toby Keith, I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. I want you to be good often, not just once. Um, and so that's where the endurance has to come in for, I want you to be stable for a long period of time as you're doing some kind of intervention or maybe you're stabilizing the patient and you have to hold an awkward position for a long period of time. I want you to be able to do that. I want you to be strong once with that heavy patient, but also often for that 12 to 24 hour shift. And I want you to be powerful for those really heavy lifting moments even though they're few and far between, maybe on a particular shift, but I want you to be able to do it in a safe manner. And um, all of these things are going to equate injury prevention. So a lot of times I think when people think injury prevention, they think just the stretching or just the core strength or just the this. Really injury prevention is the details of all of this together. 
Okay, so if we want to know where to start, first of all, I said all encompassing is mobility, right? Um, so if you're someone who is like, you know what, I have not been working out, I have not been really taking care of my body, where do I even start? Um, most of the time when someone chooses where to start, they're like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go run two miles, right? Well, two miles was at the top of our pyramid. It's a power thing. Um, or I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna start lifting. Well, lifting was in the middle of our pyramid. It's a strength thing. Why not just start with moving? Why not just go in and um, get on YouTube and find that yoga video that you can do for free that's a beginner yoga? Just move your body. Mobility and then stability is a great place um, to start. So oftentimes I'll recommend if you haven't been doing anything, do yoga twice a week for two weeks and then maybe do it three times a week for the next two weeks and then start adding in some body weight strengthening after that. So just get your body moving. You'll feel loosened up. You'll feel a lot better. And then when you go into your strengthening, you actually won't be quite as sore as you would if you would have jumped straight into everything. The other thing that we have to look at though is our body and how it moves. What is, what is the, if I say, where does that strength come from or where's that power come from? Nine times out of 10, a healthcare professional, a fitness professional, um, they're gonna tell you the core, right? So what is the core? What are your thoughts on the core? Abdomen? Abdomen, just kind of this general area, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. Um, we have a few different choices when it comes to our abdomen. Um, and we, there's actually some of it that is part of our deep core and our local core that we're going to talk about today and some of it that isn't. So one thing that is not on that list for our deep core, our local core that we're going to um, talk about today that I think a lot of people think about first is the rectus abdominis. So that's our six pack, right? Um, the rectus abdominis is very superficial. And where, from where it connects on, on the pelvis and um, the diaphragm, it's not necessarily stabilizing um, as much as these deeper muscles are. So when you think about your core, instead of thinking, well, this area or the six pack, I want you to think about if I put a cardboard box in the middle of your body, that is your core, okay? So a cardboard box has a top, it has a bottom and it has four sides, right? The top of our core, the top of that cardboard box is gonna be our diaphragm. So what's the diaphragm primarily responsible for? Breathing. Respiration, yeah. So when we go out here in a minute, we're gonna check and see if our diaphragm is doing a good job by using it with respiration. Oftentimes in the clinic with patients, we will, first thing we'll do is lay them down and just say, I just want you to breathe normal. And we'll check to see, are they using their diaphragm and allowing air to push into the bottom of their lungs and then go back out? Or they stand really superficial and shallow in their breathing and they're staying in their chest. Um, so we'll check that. The bottom of that cord cardboard box is gonna be our pelvic floor muscles. Um, I mean, primary, if you look at primary role of your pelvic floor muscles, it's to hold everything in, right? Um, but we access our pelvic floor muscles by utilizing the cues of our, if you really had kind of the Kegels type thing, if you really had to go to the bathroom, both number one and number two, um, if you had to pee or you had to poop, how would you contract so that you don't? That's gonna be your pelvic floor. And we're gonna put all that into our, our exercise today. Um, the front of that core bar box is gonna be our transverse abdominis. Um, it's really important as far as increasing that intra-abdominal pressure so that we can stabilize that low back and just um, just stabilize in general. And the TA, the transverse, is oftentimes shut off when we have someone with low back pain. Now, chicken or the egg, did the pain cause the TA to shut off or did the TA shut off and that caused low back pain? It varies per person and it's kind of hard to tell, but it's one of the ab abdominal muscles that we don't really work on very much. Another thing with core, if I you know said, hey, like we're gonna do an ab workout, what exercise you wanna do? Sit-ups, crunches, um, 
V-ups, suitcases, all those things, R Russian twists, right? In all of those situations, you're using your hip flexors and your rectus abdominis. It's very rare that you can actually get someone into their transverse abdominis while doing those exercises. They have to be very good at understanding their body. Um, planks, it's gonna get you a little bit more into your transverse. We have a quadruped position we're gonna work on today that will get you more into your transverse. Um, but you pretty much, I'm giving you permission to never do a sit up ever again. You're welcome. <laughs> Please don't. Because first of all, our psoas is out here. That's our hip flexor. It's in our global system. It's not in our local stabilizer. So if you say you want to go work abs and I'm and your hips are burning, you're clearly not working your abs, right? You're definitely in your hip flexor. Now, rectus abdominis, okay. If you want to do some crunches and you are really going for a chiseled look, you go right ahead. Um, please just stop at a crunch. Like why go up into the full setup and get into your hip flexor? Um, and then if you're doing core stuff, please just do more of the actual stuff that works your transverse abdominis and all these other muscles um, and not just the rectus abdominis. So we talked about the top is the diaphragm. It's actually our on off switch to our core. Our pelvic muscles, um, pelvic floor muscles are gonna be the bottom. Um, transverse abdominis going across the front. We have obliques on the side and we have our multifidus in the back. Um, all five of those muscle groups are gonna make up our core. Now I got, I get this information from a specific group. Um, there, if you go and you look at textbooks, you'll see just a few variations on textbook definitions. And you can kind of argue a few muscles that are in this category into this category and stuff like that. But when you look at pure location and depth of where these muscles are in the body and what they do, this is a pretty good group to start with as far as your core. So, you guys wanna know how to get to your core and do some core exercises? Yes? Okay. You're just excited I'm not making you do sit-ups, aren't you? Okay, let's go out in the hall. Okay, so everybody bend your knees and put your feet flat on the floor. One hand on your chest, one hand on your belly. Good, and I just want you to breathe normal. No snoring. <laughs> it's after lunch, isn't it? Okay, so pay attention, get a feel for your hands and which one's moving and which one's not. If your bottom hand, if the hand on your belly is the main one moving, just keep doing that. If you feel like your both hands are moving at the same time, that's gonna be fine too. If you feel like your top hand is moving first though, I want you to try to focus on moving that air into your belly so you breathe in and it fills up your belly you breathe out and your belly sinks back down because that air goes back out and all that time you're trying to keep that top hand from moving good everybody's doing a good job so on off switch to the core is our diaphragm so if you're having some low back pain, if you're having just some um, general issues like that and you're wanting to know where to start on trying to make it feel better, laying in the floor, this position puts the low back in a great position. And just to lay there and breathe, it's gonna calm down um, that neurological system, which is gonna help with discomfort, but it also puts you in a really good position um, just to help that, that area calm down as well. Okay, so now we're gonna go to pelvic floor. So we're still breathing in and out of that belly, but this time we're gonna breathe in and the belly gets big. We breathe out, the belly goes back down. And remember we said pelvic floor was pee muscles and poop muscles? Yep, so when almost all of that air is out, we're gonna squeeze those muscles lightly. We're not trying to give ourselves a hernia today. Uh, so just a gentle contraction unless you really gotta to go to the bathroom and then you might have to put more effort into it. But so everybody breathe in, belly gets big. Breathe out, light pelvic floor contraction, and then relax. Okay, breathe in, belly gets big. Breathe out, light pelvic floor contraction, and relax. Good, okay, 
Did everybody feel that? You feel kind of like everything underneath, there's like a bowl shape to your pelvis, everything kind of contracting and securing. Yes, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so now we have to put our transverse abdominis into it. You've got your hands here and here, but I want you to move them above your pelvis, below your ribs, so right in that middle section. Okay, so we're gonna do the exact same thing, except I'm gonna add one more thing that you gotta think about. So we're gonna breathe in, breathe out, squeeze pee muscles, poop muscles, but then our belly button, we're gonna push it down towards our back. So we're not sucking it in. Remember, we're breathing out. We're not pushing it out. We're pushing it like it's trying to tighten in, okay? So it's gonna be breath in, belly gets big. Breath out. Squeeze pelvic floor and push belly button in. And then relax. Do that one more time. Belly breath in, belly gets big. Belly goes back down, squeeze pelvic floor and push belly button in and relax. Okay, so the hands you have on your side, and we're gonna do that one more time. I want you to feel what those muscles do underneath your fingers, okay? So go ahead and make sure they're not just resting there, you actually are kind of gripping your muscles a little bit, okay? Um, you should feel some tension underneath your fingertips, okay? So one more time, breathe in. Breathe out, squeeze pelvic floor, push belly button in, and relax. Okay, how'd we do? Everybody feel some tension under their fingers? Yes, awesome. Okay, well, we don't operate laying down, do we? So we gotta change positions. So everybody flip over, you're gonna be on all fours. Good, hands and knees, tuck those toes under. We can actually do the exact same thing in that we did on our backs in every position we're gonna go through today, okay? Because I wanna teach you how to access your core no matter what your position is. Make sure your knees are directly under your hips and your hands are directly underneath your um, shoulders. Okay, go ahead and move your hands back just a smidge. Thank you, ma'am. And then shift your hips backwards just a little bit. There you go, hands back a little bit too. Perfect, okay. So, same thing we just did, different position. So belly breath in, belly breath out. Squeeze pelvic floor and belly button. And relax. One more time, belly breath in, belly breath out. Squeeze pelvic floor and tighten belly button. And relax, okay. We're gonna test out and see how your core is contracting by loading it up. So, when I say tighten everything up, and you tighten everything up, I'm then gonna say lift your knees about one inch off the floor. Do you wanna demonstrate really quick for me, Nick? So, you're going to belly breath in, belly breath out. He's gonna tighten his muscles that we just tightened and lift knees up, literally just a little bit off the floor. Hold for a second and go back down, and then he'll relax. Okay, so let's all do that. All right, are we ready? Belly breath in, belly breath out, tighten pelvic floor and belly button and lift knees. Hold, down slow, and relax. Okay, so when you lifted, did you feel your core take on a little bit more of the load? Like everything you were tightening, it needed to tighten just a little bit more, right? So if we activated your core, you felt the tension of the core activation, we loaded it and you felt that increased load that it needed to work harder, that right there is a core exercise. So just holding that quadruple, quadruped and maybe breathing a few times, that's a great core exercise. You can even take it a little bit further and put it into crawling. Um, so do you want to demonstrate crawling for me really quick? So crawling, exact same thing. And you can just go like three steps forward, three steps backward. He's going to belly breath in, belly breath out, contract everything. He's going to lift his knees up and then small steps forward. 
and then small steps backwards. And relax. So you can start off crawling five feet, 10 feet, wherever you're at, forwards and backwards. You feel it, don't you? <laughs> It's a really, really good um, core exercise. And what I like about the crawling, did you see how every time he took a step, his body had to like kind of rotate and shift to it? So you're teaching your core not only how to stabilize, but how to stabilize against rotation. And that a lot of times is something that is lacking in the traditional core exercises. Okay, so I said we're gonna put you in multiple positions. We don't operate on our back, usually or all fours to a certain extent, right? But where do we do operate a lot for patient care? Right here, right? Okay, so everybody kneeling position. You can be out to the side, you can be straight on. I think most of the time people kind of naturally go out to the side. First of all, whenever you do the kneeling position right here, that relaxed kneeling position, it just takes your core out of it. Um, in this position, you're relying on your limbs to be um, giving you some stability. But as soon as you come up, out of that and shift those hips forward. Now my core is activated. Now my glutes are having to help out. Um, this is a really great position to be working in because not only am I stable, I can move this more narrow or wider to get more stable, but I can also very easily shift down um, to get what I need and prepare to stand back up. In working in this position, it's a great position to work but as soon as you're ready to lift and get up, you're gonna to have to come to that one knee, okay? Oftentimes when we come to that one knee, um, you'll hear people describe knee pain or back pain um, with that type position. And really when you look at it, it's all about what muscles you use to get up. So if you go to get up and you kind of shift backwards and then kind of come up out of it, you didn't really use your core and you definitely didn't use your glutes on that. So we need to learn how to use our core and our glutes. So everybody stand up. The safe way to get into it is a reverse lunge. So you're gonna reverse down to one knee and then you can get to a, a stable position. So everybody reverse down to one knee. Good, so we load that hip. I want you to kind of pretend like you're going down to the patient. And when you do that, shift your hips backwards, keep that belly button nice and snug. Squeeze your glute, come back up with hips forward. So the glute pushed you forward, keep that belly button snug. So right now we got glute and butt kind of snug, right? Glute and belly button snug. So all you gotta do now is just shift forward back up out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so if we go to come up out of it and we stay backwards, it's gonna be hard to get up, right? We have to shift forward just a little bit, squeeze that core and glute together and come up out of it. Okay, any questions on that? Now, was everybody able to feel their core kind of even that lunge going into and coming back out of? Yeah, okay, awesome, let's head back in. So our local core, we kind of all learned how to do that. Everything outside of that is either helping our local core a little bit more globally or it's actually helping us move. So our hip flexors are kind of here, part of them are here, but then all of our really big muscle groups are really out here in our movement system. Um, oftentimes when we look at these muscle groups and you look at what people do to work out, um, let's say they're gonna go squat or they're gonna go do deadlifts, a lot of times they're working those bigger muscle groups. But just remember when you're working your core, um, that crawling's a great position, planks are a great position, and you can take planks every which way. Um, when you're on all fours, you can actually get into a dead bug where you do opposite arm and leg reaches that gets into your low back to help stabilize there too. And there's just a lot of really good stuff out there, but no, you don't have to do sit-ups anymore. So it's kind of a good day, right? Um, core progressions, we kind of went through those. Um, we were on the floor, we did our breathing. We did that belly button push in, that's a draw and maneuver. Um, we could also have gotten our glute activated with that and added it in or flipped you over and got our, our scapular stabilizers in there. We went up to quadruped, half kneeling, and then we got up to standing positions. One thing I want to point out about squatting and hip hinging 
One thing we know, so a squat is gonna often be used to decelerate our body. So when we go down into a lunge, we squat on one leg, okay? Looks exactly like when I squat with two legs, right? But think about when we're doing patient care and um, you've transported the patient and now we're transitioning them um, caught to bed right? Oftentimes there's this position that we're going to grab and pull. Well, if you do both feet up against the bed to grab and pull, you have biceps to pull, but you don't have anywhere to go unless you step back, right? So oftentimes I kind of tell people, why don't you go ahead and step back? So get that offset position, get this leg up to the bed, go ahead and grab because now I'm not using my biceps to pull. Now I'm using my whole body to pull and I'm very stable. I'm not like falling back into that. I'm just already there and I can easily and smoothly shift to transfer. So this position where we aren't sitting our butt down, we're sitting our butt back, that's a hinge, that's a hip hinge. And if you look at a lot of power moves where you need to powerfully do something, it's gonna be tied to the hip hinge. So oftentimes when people go work out, they squat. And that's it, <laughs> because we all know how to do that, right? Um, but the hip hinge, I think, gets neglected quite a bit. You'll see hip hinging, you'll see people doing cleans. That's another thing, they'll go straight to the cleans. Like, well, I squatted and I did cleans, and it's like, great. But remember our pyramid, power was up here. What's your base strength to your power? When it comes to cleans, um, the hip hinge is your base strength. So you gotta work on your strength stuff before you just jump in and start doing the power things because otherwise that's oftentimes when people get injured. When we talk about the mobility, um, we definitely have progressed in how we do mobility. So um, if I think back to when I was in high school um, and even junior high, which for me was in the 90s, it was very much do you guys remember like we're gonna go like this and we're gonna bounce and we're gonna do like 10 touches going backwards horrible oh my gosh i i hope they don't still do that um but what we do know about stretching one that ballistic bounce is not good but two what we know is that static stretching i'm just gonna stretch and hold it we know that that's not really very good before activity because it shuts down the muscle so your exception would be if you do like a light warm up, whether it be a jog or a bike or something like that, and then you want to do some static stretching, and then after static stretching, you do something to wake your muscles back up, go for it, no big deal. Um, but oftentimes what you'll see instead is dynamic stretching. So um, if we look at pre-workout stretching, this was kind of um, a study that just kind of looked at it in general and it looked at how fast you lost the effects and we're looking half of the effect in basically 10 to 30 minutes that you're losing the effect. So really with static stretching, one, you're just getting ready for what you're doing, but the dynamic stretching tends to last longer. The other thing that we've added in is soft tissue. Um, has everybody seen a foam roll at this point, a foam roller or something like that? Um, they're becoming so common. In fact, they're so common you can go to like the dollar store and Dollar Trees and um, what's that place called? Five Below? Yeah. And they have foam rollers for like super cheap. So um, they're, they're very affordable and they a little bit really does go a long way in using them. So this study in particular had looked at when you do just stretching alone, you get a 6.2% improvement in that mobility by just combining that soft tissue and increase to a 9.1%. Um, and then that post-workout is gonna have most of the prolonged benefit as compared to that pre-workout. Doesn't mean you don't warm up, doesn't mean you don't do some kind of dynamic stretching, um, but it definitely means that that static stretching needs to be saved for after the workout. And you can put foam rolling in literally throughout, before and after. So when you talk about soft tissue, the way that you do it is you get on tissue and work it out. So if it's a foam roller and you wanna work out your hamstrings, you sit on top of the foam roller with your hamstrings and you roll back and forth. 
Or if it's a smaller muscle, maybe it's a softball or a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball or something like that that's smaller for that surface area of your muscle. Um, these are some normal items that you're going to see. You'll see, um, we call it the peanut. It basically feels like two lacrosse balls that are like stuck together. Um, and it's really ideal for your spine. Um, this is a wonderful one that that and the lacrosse ball would be a great one to have in like your personal bag. So like when you go in the truck and you're sitting for an hour and a half, you can just kind of put it back behind you and kind of roll around and work out some of those knots. That would be a really great one. Um, the foam roller that we talked about, these rolling sticks are really cool because you can literally say, okay, I'm gonna roll out this, I'm gonna roll out that. You don't have to worry about putting your body weight on it, you're just manually doing. And then, has everybody seen the therapy cane? It, you can either use a therapy cane or an actual cane. <laughs> like if you have an actual cane that you, is somewhere around, literally you just get it and you hook it around to where you have that tender spot, which is generally gonna be on that upper trap and you just kind of hold into it and, and work that knot out of your muscle. So these are the soft tissue things you see. You get on that tissue, you work it out. To do your whole body, we're really looking for five to seven minutes because you're only staying on a section for 10 to 30 seconds. The reason being, and when, when all this soft tissue stuff started, um, I remember, well, I remember clinicians and I don't remember ever bruising someone, but I'm sure I was, guilty of going too hard, but we would literally get these tools and we would dig, right? We're gonna get on that quad and we're gonna dig. We're gonna get on that hamstring and we're gonna dig. And sometimes you'd have a patient or a client that would bruise or an athlete, they're like, oh, I foam roll and I bruise all the time, blah, blah, blah. Well, now we know you don't have to bruise. We don't want you to bruise actually. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, if you bruise, you're causing trauma and we're there to obviously show an improvement. Um, the other thing is we believed at the time that what we were doing was releasing the fascia from the muscle. So if I am going to try to affect the fascia of the, or the lining of the muscle with my hands, research is showing that I have to be able to elicit 500 to 2000 pounds of pressure. I'm not that heavy. I'm not that strong. And I don't plan to be. <laughs> That's a lot, right? 2,000 potential pounds of pressure to affect the fascia of a muscle. So why am I digging so hard? And then the other question is, when we did our soft tissue stuff, people felt better. So if it didn't affect the fascia, why did they feel better? Um, so the theory behind it, the, the research is kind of pointing to, we didn't affect the fascia directly, we affected it indirectly. And what we did was we affect the nerve endings that desensitizes that, that neurological system in that area and that actually affects the skin lig ligaments that eventually will kind of affect the fascia. It becomes an indirect thing. So you're getting a neurological effect. So I don't know about you, I like feeling good, right? We, nobody likes to feel bad. Nobody likes to be hurting. Nobody likes that feeling of discomfort. Um, so to know that I can get on one of these things and I can work my tissue and it makes me feel better, I'm all in as far as that goes. So no, you don't have to bruise. No, you don't have to cause any kind of discomfort. These things will be uncomfortable when you're rolling over certain areas because your nerves are sensitive. Um, just gotta kind of keep breathing, release your pressure just a little bit, do your 10 to 30 seconds, move on to the next muscle group. Any questions on soft tissue? No, okay. Um, I, sorry, I have these X'd out. So if for whatever reason um, you've bought one of these tools or some cups, I tend to just recommend that you say like, have your healthcare professional doing those, your rehab clinician, PT, AT, OT, um, because you actually can do some damage with those. And so um, if you're gonna buy something for your house or, or for your personal use, maybe just stick to lacrosse ball, foam roller, and therapy canes. Performance enhancement. Okay, when we go to work out, we're gonna train like we work. Um, what I mean by that is, um, when you think about your shift, you don't lift heavy the entire shift. You may have a heavy shift that has a lot of calls that have a heavy lift in it, um, but you don't lift heavy the whole time. 
So circuit training actually tends to be more of the recommended training type for, for um, fitness. When this particular study, it was looking at a heavy session versus a cross or a circuit training type sec, uh, session. And what it found was that it actually took about 24 hours to fully recover from a heavy session and less than 12 hours to fully recover it from circuit, circuit training. So the takeaway from that for me is if you are someone who wants to lift heavy, maybe two or three times a week and you're doing circuit training maybe once a week or something like that, your heavy sessions do not need to be before a shift. <laughs> because if, you, if it takes you 24 hours to fully recover and you do a heavy session and then go into your shift, you don't have anything left in your tank. And then if you do have one of those shifts that's a heavy shift, there's a lot of calls, there's a lot of lift assist, there's a lot of things going on in, in, that, in that particular shift, and you don't have anything left in the tank, now you're more susceptible to injury. You literally could have just moved that workout and it would have decreased your risk of injury. So the timing of it's gonna be really important. Exercise selection, it needs to be multi-planar. So remember I said when we did our, um, our core stuff, a traditional core stuff like a sit-up is one plane of motion, right? I'm just going this way. But if I'm in all fours and I'm doing that, that crawling, every time I go to lift and my body's resisting rotation, I'm having to stabilize in one plane and resist movement in another plane. So it's multi-planar. Same thing if I'm just gonna go do some traditional lunges and I have my, my weight right here, go back into your lunge, but why not add just a little bit of rotation It'll challenge your balance, it'll add that plane of motion, get your body used to multiple planes of motion. Because when we look at how we work, and if you kind of watch coworkers or watch other people as you guys are learning these skills and, and doing these different training sessions, you'll notice we don't, we don't operate in one plane of motion, right? Other than, well, walking, but we have to walk around obstacles. We very rarely are just going one way. Um, and then work rest cycles. So we talked about you guys have those long duration type things within the job, so that long periods of sitting, but you also have those short bursts, like we've been sitting for a long time and now we have to quickly go and we have to quickly do and if you have to be ready to do something right now. So when you're doing your training, it shouldn't just be I'm gonna go for a long run, it should be, well, maybe today I'm gonna go for a long run, but maybe tomorrow I'm gonna do something that has more short bursts of energy or, or high intensity or, or my weightlifting is not just how many reps can I do, it's maybe a shorter um, burst of, of that weightlifting. So, any questions on program design? And that's it.